Profit and Loss by Robin Donat Tagore When a daughter was born after five sons, her parents dotingly named her Nirupama. Such a high-flown name had never been heard in the family before. Usually names of gods and goddesses were used, Ganesh, Kartik, Parvati, and so on. The question of Nirupama's marriage now arose. Her father Ram Shundar Mitra searched and searched without finding a groom he really liked. But in the end he procured the only son of a grand Rai Bahadur. The ancestral wealth of this Rai Bahadur had diminished considerably. But the family was certainly noble. They asked for a dowry of 10,000 rupees and many additional gifts. Ram Shundar agreed without a thought. Such a groom should not be allowed to slip through one's fingers. But no way could he raise all the money. Even after pawning, selling and using every method he could, he still owed 6,000 or 7,000 rupees and the day of the wedding was drawing near. The wedding day came. Someone had agreed to lend the rest of the money at an extortionate rate of interest, but he failed to turn up on the day. A furious scene broke out in the marriage room. Ram Shundar fell on his knees before the Rai Bahadur implored him not to bring bad luck by breaking off the ceremony, insisted he would pay him in full. If you can't hand the money to me now, replied the Rai Bahadur, the bridegroom will not be brought here. The women of the house wept and wailed at this disastrous upset. The root cause of it sat mutely in her silk wedding dress and ornaments, her forehead decorated with sandal paste. It cannot be said that she felt much love or respect for her prospective husband's family. Suddenly the impasse was resolved. The groom rebelled against his father saying firmly, this haggling and bartering means nothing to me. I came here to marry and marry I shall. You see, sir, how young men behave these days, said his father to everyone he turned to. It's because they have no training in morality or the Shastras, said some of the oldest there. The Rai Bahadur sat despondent at seeing the poisonous fruits of modern education in his own son. The marriage was completed in a gloomy, joyless sort of way. As Nirupama left for her in-law's house, her father clasped her to his breast and could not hold back his tears. Won't they let me come and visit you, father? She asked. Why shouldn't they, my love? said Ram Shundar. I will come and fetch you. Ram Shundar often went to see his daughter, but he had no honor in his son-in-law's house. Even the servants looked down on him. Sometimes he saw his daughter for five minutes in a separate outer room of the house. Sometimes he was not allowed to see her at all. To be disgraced so in a kinsman's house was unbearable. He decided that somehow or other the money would have to be paid, but the burden of debt on his shoulders was already hard to control. Expenses dragged at him terribly. He had to resort to all sorts of petty subterfuges to avoid running into his creditors. Meanwhile, his daughter was treated spitefully at every turn. She shut herself into her room and wept. 
a daily penance for the insults heaped on her family. Her mother-in-law's assaults were especially vicious. If anyone said how pretty that girl is, it's a pleasure to look at her. She would burst out, pretty indeed, pretty as the family she came from. Even her food and clothing were neglected. If a kind neighbor expressed concern, her mother-in-law would say, she has more than enough, implying that if the girl's father had paid full price, she would have received full care. Everyone treated her as if she had no rights in the household and had entered it by deceit. Naturally, news of the contempt and shame his daughter was suffering reached Ramshundar. He decided to sell his house. He did not, however, tell his sons that he was making them houseless. He intended to rent the house back after selling it. But this ploy, his sons would not know the true situation till after his death but his sons found out. They came and protested vigorously. The three older boys particularly were married and probably had children. Their objections were so forceful that the sale was stopped. Ram Shundar then started to raise money by taking out small loans from various quarters at high interest so much so that he could no longer meet household expenses. Nirupama understood everything from her father's expression. The old man's gray hair, pallid face and permanently cowering manner all indicated poverty and worry. When a father lets down his own daughter, he cannot disguise the guilt he feels. Whenever Ramshundar managed to get permission to speak to his daughter for a few moments, it was clear at once, even from his smile, how heartbroken he was. She longed to return to her father's house for a few days to console him. To see his sad face made it awful to be away. One day she said to Ramshundar, Father, Take me home for a while. Very well, he replied, but he had no power to do so. The natural claims that a father has to his daughter had been pawned in place of a dowry. Even a glimpse of his daughter had to be begged for meekly, and if, if on any occasion it was not granted, he was not in a position to ask a second time. But if his daughter herself wished to come home, how could he not bring her? It is better not to tell the story of the indignity, shame and hurt that Ram Shundar had to endure in order to raise the 3,000 rupees that he needed for an approach to his daughter's father-in-law. Wrapping the bank notes in a handkerchief, tied into a corner of his chadar, he went to see him. He began breezily with local news, describing at length a daring theft in Hare Krishna's house, comparing the abilities and characters of Nobin Madhob and Radha Madhob. He praised Radha Madhob and criticized Nobin Madhob. He gave a hair-raising account of a new illness in town. Finally, putting down the hookah, he said as if in passing, Yes, yes, brother, there's still some money owing, I know. Every day I remember and mean to come along with some of it, but then it slips my mind. I'm getting old, my friend. At the end of this long preamble, he casually produced the three notes, which were really like three of his ribs. The Rai Bahadur burst into coarse laughter at the sight of them. Those are no use to me, 
he said, making it plain by using a current proverb that he did not want to make his hands sting for no reason. After that, to ask to bring Nirupama home seemed out of the question. Though Ram Shundar wondered what good he was doing to himself by observing polite forms. After sitting in heart-stricken silence for a long time, he did at last softly raise the matter. Not now, said the Rai Bahadur. Giving no reason, then he left to go about his work. Unable to face his daughter, hands trembling, Ram Shundur tied the three banknotes back into the end of his chadar and set off home. He resolved never to return to the Rai Bahadur's house until he had paid the money in full. Only then could he lay claim to Nirupama confidently. Many months passed. Nirupama sent messenger after messenger, but her father never appeared. In the end, she took offense and stopped sending. This grieved Ramshundur sorely, but he still would not go to her. The month of Ashwin came. This year I shall bring Nirupama home for the puja or else, he said to himself, making a fierce vow. On the fifth or sixth day of the puja fortnight, Ramshundar once again tied a few notes into the end of his chadar and got ready to go out. A five-year-old grandson came and said, Grandpa, are you going to buy a cart for me? For weeks he had set his heart on a push cart to ride in, but there had been no way of meeting his wish. Then a six-year-old granddaughter came and said tearfully that she had no nice dress to wear for the puja. Ramshundar knew that well and had brooded over it for a long time as he smoked. He had sighed to think of the women of his household attending the puja celebrations at the Rai Bahadur's house like paupers receiving charity, wearing whatever miserable ornaments they had. But his thoughts had no result other than making the old man's lines on his forehead even deeper. With the cries of his poverty-stricken household ringing in his ears, Ram Shundur arrived at the Rai Bahadur's house. Today there was no hesitation in his manner, no trace of the nervous glances with which he had formerly approached the great keeper and servants. It was as if he was entering his own house. He was told that the Rai Bahadur was out, he would have to wait a while. But he could not hold back his longing to meet his daughter. Tears of joy rolled down his cheeks when he saw her. Father and daughter wept together. Neither of them could speak for some moments. Then Ramshundar said, This time I shall take you, my dear. Nothing can stop me now. Suddenly Ramshundar's eldest son, Hara Mohan burst into the room with his two small sons. Father, he cried, have you really decided to turn us out on the streets? Ram Shundar flared up. Should I condemn myself to hell for your sakes? Won't you let me do what is right? He had sold his house. He had gone to great lengths to conceal the sale from his sons. But to his anger and dismay, it appeared that they had found out all the same. His grandson clasped him round his knees and looked up, saying, Grandpa, haven't you bought me that cart? When he got no answer from the now crestfallen Ramshundar, 
the little boy went up to Nirupoma and said, Auntie, will you buy me a cart? Nirupoma had no difficulty in understanding the whole situation. Father, she said, if you give a single pesa more to my father-in-law, I swear solemnly you, are, you will never see me again. What are you saying, child? said Ramsundar. If I don't pay the money, the shame will be forever on my head, and it will be your shame too. The shame will be greater if you pay the money, said Nirubhama. Do you think I have no honor? Do you think I'm just a money bag? The more money in it, the higher my value? No, father. Don't shame me by paying this money. My husband doesn't want it anyway. But then they won't let you come and see me, said Ram Shundar. That can't be helped, said Nirupama. Please don't try to fetch me anymore. Ram Shundar tremblingly pulled his chadar with the money tied into it back round his shoulders and left the house like a thief again, avoiding everyone's stare. It did not, however, remain a secret that Ram Shundar had come with the money and that his daughter had forbidden him to hand it over. An inquisitive servant, a listener at keyholes, passed the information on to Nirupama's mother-in-law whose malice towards her daughter-in-law now went beyond all limits. The household became a bed of nails for her. Her husband had gone off a few days after their wedding to be deputy magistrate in another part of the country. Claiming that Nirupama could be corrupted by contact with her relatives, her in-laws now completely forbade her from seeing them. She now fell seriously ill, but this was not wholly her mother-in-law's fault. She herself had neglected her health dreadfully. On chilly autumn nights, she lay with her head near the open door, and she wore no extra clothes during the winter. She ate irregularly. The servants would sometimes forget to bring her any food. She would not then say anything to remind them. She was forming a fixed belief that she her was herself a servant in the household, dependent on the favors of her master and mistress. But her mother-in-law could not stand even this attitude. If Nirupama showed lack of interest in food, she would say, What a princess she is! A poor household's fare is not to her liking. Or else she would say, Look at her! What a beauty! She is more and more like a piece of burnt wood. When her illness got worse, her mother-in-law said, It's all put on. Finally, one day, Nirupama said humbly, Let me see my father and brothers just once, mother. Nothing but a trick to get to her father's house, said her mother-in-law. It may seem unbelievable, but the evening when Nirupama's breath began to fail was when the doctor was first called and it was the last visit that he made too. The eldest daughter-in-law in the household had died and the funeral rites were performed with appropriate pomp. The Rai Chodhuris were renowned in the district for the lavishness with which they performed the immersion of the deity at the end of Durga Puja. But the Rai Bahadur's family became famous for the way Nirupama was cremated. Such a huge sandalwood pyre had never been seen. 
only they could have managed such elaborate rites. And it was rumored that they got rather into debt as a result. Everyone gave Ram Shundur long descriptions of the magnificence of his daughter's death when they came to condole with him. Meanwhile, a letter from the deputy magistrate arrived. I have made all necessary arrangements here, so please send my wife to me quickly. The Rai Bahadur's wife replied, Dear son, we have secured another girl for you, so please take leave soon and come home. This time the dowry was 20,000 rupees cash down.